Good. All right, everyone. Welcome again to this week's edition of the uh, Bigfoot um, Notes from the Field. We have uh, actually all three of our um, regional directors on this evening. So uh, David's in the in the background listening in. So uh, and Gerald, sorry we didn't get you on, man. We get, we'll try to get people on as we can. We only have room for four, four spots in here. But uh, so let me start out like we usually do with a little bit of uh, news going on. And of course, this is where I, this is where I get to plug my own stuff. So I, I published my tenth book yesterday. Right. Uh, it's available on it's available on Kindle now. This is this was a project that I sort of played with for the past few years, and it's just been kind of sitting there in a file for a while. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I decided to drag it out and, and continue on with it, and finish it up, and get it out of my hair. So, which there isn't a lot of. So you know, uh, one less thing to hang up there. But anyway, uh, and yeah. and the yeah, there we go. See, and and uh, the Bigfoot one hundred and one. Our Bigfoot Fieldwork 101 books, I'll be getting back on those and uh, getting the other four wrapped up. Okay, we'll bring, try Gerald again. I'll be trying to get those wrapped up here as soon as possible so that all 10 of those are published. Um, so we were going to talk about uh, reports and reporting tonight. And, and Tom and I spent almost four hours on Skype yesterday talking about this, uh, among other things. But... Um, one of the things we talked about was, and, and Tom, I'm going to go ahead and let you pick it up from here, you know, because you had a lot of great questions and, um, you know, doing a reporter, collecting a Bigfoot report is a lot more than just, you know, going and talking to a witness and, and recording what they had to say, because uh, there's, there's a great deal more you can do with that. And in fact, Jeremiah, whenever we can get him back on, uh, he had an individual, no, it was, or was it you? I can't remember. It was one of you two that had an individual and there turned out to be a whole, maybe it was Jeremiah, a lot more information about it. I told him to keep digging and, and pretty soon the whole thing really mushroomed. Uh, and there was just a, a ton more information that came out, uh, you know, surrounding that. So Tom, go ahead and, uh, uh, let's I'll let you go ahead and, uh, pick it up here about interviewing. All right. Yeah. And so I had something similar to you guys. And what I had was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my team member, Jeremy Benson, he's in the northern part of Idaho. He interviewed a witness and it was one of those reports that was a peripheral report. So by peripheral, we're saying it wasn't a direct sighting, but there were a number of coincidence or incidents that happened mm -hmm. as part of this report. And I think it's it's a fascinating example of how something that seems maybe innocuous at the time, especially to the person, when you go back and really investigate it and look at what's happening around the area or what has happened around that area, you may begin to see a pattern emerge. And that's this is the case. Uh, this particular incident, uh, again, Jeremy Benson took this statement and interviewed this person who had a series of encounters in 1988 and it was well they were living in while well, this person was living in Washington state so one of the regions that's closer to uh, uh, Thorfinn's realm his area in northern Washington it was in Snohomish County and what had happened was that it was it was a young mother. She was a 23-year-old woman, 1988, mm -hmm. and they were camping around the northern part, outside of Granite Falls, about 21 miles west of Granite Falls, at a place called the Big Four Ice Caves. So that's a, a fairly popular spot. And what they decided to do as a family was to camp not near the campground, by the big four ice caves, but they made their own way. So they took Mountain Loop Highway, which is north of the big four ice caves, and they parked along the side of the road and they hiked in. They hiked in about, well, about four and a half miles or so and found a suitable campsite. And in the process, they met another family. So this was a woman, uh, a husband, and three children. It was a, a man, the, um, the young boy was eight, and then he had an older sister and a, and a younger sister. 
And what happened was they, after they set up camp in this re very remote place, they did meet another couple coming in. They did some camping with them. It was quite a remote place. There weren't any other campers around. And there was a river that was uh, close by. It was the Stilgwamish River, the South Fork of the Stilgwamish River. And they, they were parked, they were camped alongside that river. Well, they went out during the day for a day hike along the river and noticed almost instantly a putrid smell. And it was an, you know, an odd, strange uh, scent. And they thought for a moment they'd camp near some rotting carcass. So they were, they were concerned that you know, maybe they were in a bear kill area or there was something, something there, but the smell went away. And uh, then it reemerged again as they hiked along the river. But what they found, which was really curious, was a tree about eight feet tall, a, a young tree that had several salmon, whole salmon stuck at, in the top of the tree. And the, the salmon was fairly fresh, so it hadn't yet rotted. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, mm -hmm. so it wasn't desiccated and, and stinking and, and decomposing. It was still fairly fresh. And they thought that was the, the oddest thing. They couldn't, they couldn't explain that. They didn't understand how a bear could have done that or, or even a cat. It just looked odd. Now, at the time, none of them thought Bigfoot. That wasn't on their mind. And they had some, it, it turns out when he, this fellow interviewed these, this, this woman, she had heard of Bigfoot but hadn't really uh, thought about it as much uh, being in that area and didn't know anything about the standard Bigfoot behaviors that you hear about now on television, you know, so it wasn't so widely publicized. Right. And she was a, they were outdoors people. So they were campers, hunters, fishermen, and they were familiar with the, the wildlife and that particular area. And what they thought it was could have been a bear. Well, anyway, later on that day, they just passed it on and thought it was a strange kind of bizarre incident, but uh, let it go. And they went and camped. And that evening, the husbands went into town to go get some supplies and the wives built up the campfire. And then the stink started to come through again. And they you know, thought, oh no, what, what's this? And it, it came and it passed again. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they heard knocking noises. And so they heard a noise that they described as a tree on tree, someone hitting a tree. And this happened back and forth in the, several times over the course of, it was about 40, 45 minutes that this went on, this knocking back and forth. And then they, it ended with a crescendo of footfalls, big steps and crashing through the forest around the area. And this woman was was frightened, but she still, she didn't understand what the knocking was all about. Uh, it, was, it was again, just kind of wrote it off as odd and figured that perhaps the footfalls could have been a bear, could have been some other big, big animal. But she said it was, they were loud and uh, crashing. And it sounded, you know, when she thought back about it after these many years, it sounded like big, single you know, bipedal footsteps right now yeah so anyway what was so curious about this is she hadn't thought anything of this until um jeremy was asking people he knew if they'd had bigfoot encounters and you know he talked to her about that so she shared with uh, him that as the years went on and she learned more about bigfoot you know through television and whatever else was happening the many programs that she thought it was so peculiar that these things might have been related to a Bigfoot in the area. It's just that, again, at the time, her only frame of reference was bear. So that, you know, that was what was happening was there's a big bear out there. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when he starts, when Jeremy starts doing a little further investigation, if you take a look and you go ahead, you can Google Snohomish County in Washington and you'll find out that's one of the <laughs> that's one of the top spots if you want to see a Bigfoot. Oh yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of sightings right in that area. And he's and you start going through some of the sightings that you can find that are just online. I mean, this isn't even 
This is a very go. simple, simple search. And what you find is you, you'll find incidents where they had the same putrid smell just south of Mountain Loop Highway where they were located. Right. So in the very same place, the very kinds of uh, stinky smells in the footfalls. I hadn't, we didn't find anything yet about, about the salmon. You start but finding you start correlation, you know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's what we, that's essentially what, what he's doing, Jeremy's doing now is he's expanding uh, that search and he'll be contacting uh, Thorfinn in Washington and passing that information along to see if that could be helpful in expanding, in, in expanding any of his current research. Absolutely, yeah, that's the way to do it. The frig, man. Hey, Tom, can I, not to, not to shift gears on you necessarily, but um, I know you spent a lot of time interviewing Will earlier today. Yes. I'm sorry, yesterday. Yesterday, yes. And then sending us the files. I went through some of that and, and kind of picked out a few things and some things that I had thought about before when we had started to talk about our formatting for reporting. Yes. Want to get into some of that potentially? Uh, of Abs absolutely. Results, or we can kind of maybe uh, frame out some of that and, and uh, you know, for the benefit since we've got all, it, it sounds like I have a difficulty getting on, but since we pretty much got all of us in one place here for the first time. Yeah, it's a, it's a good time to talk about it. And that's kind of what I had in mind was, you know, we can sort of, I mean, we, we can talk about individual reports, things that go on, but, you know, sort of what goes into a report and, and not, like I said, not just the details, but um, there are a lot of things that surround a report, surround a sighting, uh, a lot of peripheral things. And then you have to match up, you know, you start, you start getting pieces from uh, the surrounding area. You know, we talk about like uh, other witnesses in the area and things like that. So I I'll let you guys go ahead and, uh, and start that. Let me try to bring on, I guess I can bring on Gerald. Uh, since mind if I kind of go on down my little list of, of uh, you know, kind of what I was gathering from that and, sure. and the, get you guys input on it. You know, in the military, I'm, of course, you know, old time army guy, you know, we used what was called, and Tom and I've talked quite a bit about this some uh, on our own uh, in the last couple of days, uh, but used a uh, spot report, a salute report, you know, just a generalized, which is, you know, size, activity, time, location, unit, and all that kind of stuff that doesn't apply to this, but just trying to keep a, a general framework. So what I was hearing uh, from the interview are, are some key tenants that you do, and this is, the, you know, some of the things you do in human intelligence when you go out and you deal with somebody. First of all, you have to understand your subject. You have to understand the, the potential uh, psychological frame of mind they might be in. A lot of people are apprehensive. I mean, thinking about, you know, I, I know I had a particular uh, encounter and, and embarrassing sometimes to talk about uh, <laughs> dealing with people. Um, but you know, be, you know, number one is probably being respectful, uh, letting them know that you're not going to be done. You know, trying to you know build that rapport, that connection with them. And, and that's all I would say, you, know, you want to open it up and be respectful. And you let them know you're not there to judge them. Uh, potentially, let them know, you know if you've had one to say, you know, hey, I'm not just interested. I'm one of you. You know, I've I've been there. I know how you're feeling. And that you're because to be honest with you, before I talk to you, Will, there's only one other person I talked to who actually heard what I heard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that felt like it almost, it was such a, a weight off of me to know that there was somebody else out because everybody else does the kind of, you know, big sigh. Or and that's very common. Plausible. Right. And, and they lean more toward, they trust your character, but they still just kind of go well you know I'm skeptic. i don't know so. exactly you can't really unless you unless you've had some kind of experience like that it's really difficult to you know sort of meet that other person eye to eye uh you can't really make a connection with them and i know i've i've gotten instant rapport with many many witnesses because what I, i'll say i'll start talking within 30 seconds they know that i saw what they saw and vice versa, right. you know, it's, I mean, not all of, all of us, you know, have that experience. Tom doesn't yet. Of course, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to break his cherry on that one at some point, but, 
<laughs> we'll get you an underwear changing moment there, Tom. You got to let before you. You got to let people know before you go out, and then we'll just check. Because if you just go off the net for a long time, we'll just have to put you in that missing four one. That's right. We'll know. We'll know what happened. <laughs> but you. Uh, so be respectful, you know, let them know that you're not, that you're not there to judge. And we do this with soldiers when we're interviewing them yeah. to let them know, because, you know, people are especially soldiers, but people in general want to be reviewed, viewed and remembered in a positive way. Absolutely. And so there's always a fear of being viewed negatively. So when you, mm-hmm. you know, not only, you know, am I not here to judge you, but you're also potentially helping uh, add to the body of knowledge on the stuff. So then they're participating, not just recalling something and you're, you're kind of just, you know, taking a police report, mm-hmm. you know, so it, you know, sometimes you can get people more interactive with you. If you say, look, you don't have to be a scientist. We're just trying to get the details of what it is. One thing Tom said the other day that I just, uh, I really took interest to is that he recommend that you take somebody back in time earlier that day and, and they start recalling things because, you know, it, and cognition, you know, they tend to, uh, uh, you know, we associate memories with uh, multiple sense of sensory input. Right. You know, if there's somebody that's a stroke victim and they can't, you know, they, they regain some ability, but they have difficulty finding words mm-hmm. and sentences because they've lost the connection to whatever it was. Maybe they remembered something and they associate it with orange. Right. You know, or a piece of silverware or something, you know, and they can't think of the name of that object. You have to literally pick up an object. Right. And, and <laughs> have to say what your real name is over and over and over again with an unlike object in their hand mm-hmm. so that they and they register it in a different neural pathway. Exactly. So, you know, you know, I think that's excellent having them go back to a, a point in time earlier that day that's totally unrelated to that right. traumatic event. And that's, and that's what I talked about with Tom yesterday. I said, first of all, when I interview somebody, I have them tell me about what they were doing before the incident took place. And then later on, now you can either do it the same day or later, uh, because you, you if you get, hey, there's Gerald, uh, with a witness. Now, if you get a good, a really good, interesting situation that happened, uh, down the road, you can go and talk to the person and talk to them about something completely unrelated. You're talking cars, you know, the dog, whatever. And and oftentimes through the course of a, a totally unrelated conversation, things will hit their memory. And, and they'll say, wow, I remembered this piece, like you said, Jay, because something will jog their memory in something that's totally unrelated, but it, it makes a connection in those neural pathways. So... And especially if it was something that was two or more sensory inputs, it really bonds it much stronger in their minds. Gerald, do you have a TV on? <laughs> yeah, hold on. I'll, uh, I'll go to the other room. Okay, I can, I can hear that. I can hear Jim. I can hear your TV. <laughs> I was listening to the debate. Uh, so, then, so then you, uh, uh, that's not important. This is a much more important subject. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I apologize. We have, to, we have an ability to influence this process, not necessarily that one. But, <laughs> uh, so, okay. So, you you know, be respectful, make a connection, uh, let them know they're being, they're part of, uh, you know, the solution process. That way they, they join in the positive framework mm-hmm. and, and view themselves as positive um uh smile you know I, i'm mm-hmm. not a big smiler but you know, smile what's important to keep yourself positive. <laughs> uh, that's right you know there are i'm in north alabama you know there's places here i go and, and you know put real names for everything and mm-hmm. you know you go rolling up in somebody's yard and they've got six dogs and nine kids and you know mm-hmm. and you wait their front porch, you know, they're, they're looking at you like, you know, who, who are you at, you know, are you the IRS? I mean, you know, right, right. 
when you start it, if they're cold calling and you start a conversation with somebody, but it's interesting how they will open up to you. If you can find a common ground. I, I talked Absolutely. to a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago and I noted that the woman was because I, I went to follow up on something. Uh, a guy told me about somebody he grew up with that was from a, a local town. He said, you know, the guy did tend to drink a lot, but I went to saw him. But I asked him if there were other places or people in the area, and he said, well, just drive down this other road. All those people are friendly down through there, mm-hmm. and it's kind of near, near uh, uh, you know, they called it the creek thing or the slough thing. Sure. Thing, T-H-A-N-J. Uh, <laughs> so I saw some folks out there. I mean, seriously, that's what they call it, T-H-A-N-J. <laughs> Uh, so, so I, I saw these folks stand up in front of their house, and I, I passed it by, and I thought, no, you know what? They, I'm going to go talk to them. they got a bunch of little kids. You know, that kind of noise tends to potentially attract these you mm-hmm. know, things in. And stuff. Let me go see. So I went up there and I'm wearing an army jacket, and I happened to have a airborne shirt. And, hey, you know, here's my name. This is what I'm doing. You know, interested. So they got the army thing, and then we kind of talked about that at first. And they started talking about, yeah, we've been hearing these these female type screams coming from behind our house. My in their only son wasn't there at the time, and he had pictures of an odd footprint and some ball marks they found up in a tree and some other things. So I haven't uh, I haven't got that evidence yet, mm-hmm. uh, but, it, but it, they, well, you know, so you open up to them and get that going. Then when, when we go into collecting reports, uh, I would really want to take some baseline demographic. Uh, you want to get the daytime group, uh, number of witnesses, perhaps, you know, perhaps gender. Uh, I call it the environmental, you know, weather, illumination, mm-hmm. basic layout of the terrain. Right. And then, you know, the graphic location. And, and I've sent Tom and Will, you both, uh, and, and Daniel, one guy, and the group. Just going back and forth with kind of camping and the shop. Find it, and then just some general kind of bullets of um, the general scenario of what happened, and saving it as a JPEG, and it may just be an addition that we put into the database or something. So, you know, when you read about, it, like I was trying to jot out when Tom was talking about that report, uh, because you know I'm interested, even though that's not my region, I'm interested in in you know pulling up those those areas and road intersections, like you and I were talking well about that research. That mm-hmm. I heard that 911 call from the homeless woman. She said, you know, we were near this highway that and near this road intersection. I'm like, I can look that up. Sure. So I looked it up in Google Earth. It dropped the, uh, you know, the Google map, uh, you know, street view. Could see the water towers, could see the wood line, you know, and, and you know, in this, so you could kind of look at the lay of the land. Right. And then when you zoom out, you're like, man, that, you know, that's an urban area. There's there's a lot of houses that's kind of close to being in town, and I'm thinking, you know, that people would dismiss that and say that's not possible mm-hmm. here, there, but then you know, we're only talking, uh, you know, a few miles from <laughs> right other place. But anyway, so you know, gathering some of uh, you know baseline demographic, take time groups, some environmental location, um, you know, take a little. Uh, Page out of Will's book, you know, what's your previous knowledge on the subject to establish kind of a baseline of, of uh, what their knowledge was and what, you know, interest is and all that. Right. And to see if they're putting any artificial information from their mind, their frame of reference into the story they're telling, you know, before all this stuff got really public, there wasn't all that. So the information, and I think we talked about like pre uh, Bluff Creek, you know, prior to that, there wasn't a lot of information out there. So when the person related a story, it was pretty much what they experienced, what they saw after that time. And since then, the more stuff gets out in the public uh, venue, you know, even, and, and I've been, Tom and I talked about this when you, even when somebody, let's say they're totally disinterested in the subject, right? They walk by a television, finding Bigfoot's on, and maybe they see something for 10 or 15 seconds. It still gets in here. It's embedded, even if they don't consciously realize that information went in because they heard it, they saw it, it was recorded. So when a situation happens, they're in that situation. When they go to relay that situation, 
whatever pieces they picked up get plugged into what it is they're telling. And that's an artificial piece of information that's part of that whatever happened. Uh, it's how they it's how they're able to you know relay that situation by using those things that they have in their frame of reference. I think it's interesting whenever you go to the finding Bigfoot stuff, it's always whoa, <laughs> you know, it's more than kind of recorded thing. It's all total like crap. Everything, <laughs> nothing like what I heard. Yeah, but I've listened to you know many of the Sasquatch Chronicles episodes that you were on before, and I can't tell you. How many of those sighting reports, the second part of what I heard was that deep, guttural, growling, <laughs> red deep report that yeah. to this high pitch, you know, eerie, banshee, which like scream. That was the second part of what I heard. Exactly. It was very primate. It was very ape like. It was that woofing. And, and that's the way. That's the way the vocals have been described for decades as they start out with that low, rumbling kind of growl and then work up. To that high pitched scream, and and it's what I've heard many times in the field. I mean, I've heard a lot of different vocals, but that's the most common one. Yeah. But you know that to me that you know when I when I hear that it's it's like okay somebody's not you know and I've heard recordings played uh, uh, you know that that to me I'm going that's a person. Absolutely. You know, what I is definitely outside of the realm of human capability. There's no way that, that a yeah. human being one span that vocal range, but well, I'm going off here. We just say this stuff right here. I'm starting to have a hard time. Robert, Robert. Hey, hey Jay, may I ask one question, guys? I just wanted to inter interject and sort of elaborate on, on what Jay was saying <laughs> to, to bridge the two things. Uh, I put over in the, the notes in the chat one of the uh, a reference to the almanac. And the reason for that is, and I just want to highlight something that Jay said, which was gathering the, the demographics and just the basic information. Mm -hmm. Well, when Jeremy went to talk to this witness, this particular incident happened uh, in 1988. Mm -hmm. And so some of the details were missing. Mm -hmm. But what, what detail was the two details that were relevant were that she knew the month that mm -hmm. this happened and didn't know if it was the beginning or the end of the month. And didn't know what day of the week it was, but she did know what the weather was like, the temperature, and she also knew the uh, what the state of the moon was. So she said the moon was almost full, or it was very bright, and it was uh, a certain temperature. Now, if you go back, I have in the almanac, you can do a historical weather search. Exactly. And, so you can, and so we. And there's another, week. and there's another important component to that verification. You know, and I've made the mistake myself in recent times by not going back and utilizing that particular information that's out there, weather, moon and sun condition, things like that, to verify a story uh, and found out later that, you know, the witness described those things was not what those conditions were. So, you know, it's it also can, it can help you pinpoint information and it helps you verify what that person said. So very two very important components there. And you never know, as you say, when what's going to be relevant. Like you told, uh, yeah, I, or I think uh, Will was telling me some of his witness eyewitness accounts, and there was a, a detail about this particular family just be being new to farming. Oh, and then also the the radishes. Yeah. Could could you tell that really quickly, the radish story? Well, you know, now this was this was the Goldhammer incident back in 1989, and I and I, it's you know what the book Haunted Valley was about. Um, when I went there, now the, those folks were brand new from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Were city people, had never lived in the country. They bought 13 acres south of the town of Yakult, and that's a little place out in the middle of nowhere. There's Gerald knows, you know, it's built up a little now, but it's still kind of out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And uh, that part of the Akholt Valley, most of the people who lived there were older folks in those days, so they didn't utilize their acreage. So nobody went out in the valley in that part of the, of the area. So these folks bought 13 acres, and they decided they were going to try their hand at all kinds of things. So they bought a horse, and they tried. They planted a garden. And, and you know, if you grow radishes, they, they grow like weeds. They multiply like crazy. So 
they didn't like the radishes when they grew them. So they put pull, pull a handful out for the horse every night. Well, the horse didn't like them either. So uh, around the time their first sighting of this creature happened, uh, every morning they'd find the pile of radishes gone, and they assumed some other animal must have taken them and eaten them. So, And it was a pretty good handful, you know, that they would take. And uh, I told them, I said, well, don't change the conditions because, uh, you know, that's what I was taught in my anthropology courses. If you want to observe a primate in, in the wild without uh, altering whatever it is their behaviors are, you don't want to do anything. You don't want to introduce anything into the environment or disturb the environment at all. You want to just simply observe. So I said, keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, more things will probably happen. So, and I don't know how far you want me, did you want me to tell about the horse and all that? Or, I mean, we could go on about that whole thing. It was, it yeah, was the only thing I wanted to, to make a note of there was, that was, th that accomplished a couple of different things. One is that conversation you had was rapport building. So mm -hmm, you found absolutely. out some facts, some facts about this family and you were talking about their move from the city to the country and to their, oh, yeah. their, their venture in farming. And then you learn this strange detail of, of the radishes. And then well, that, that came, later came into play. Well, here's something you can do. And, and I'll, I'll, as my advice to you guys, uh, when you're interviewing people now, that situation, I found out about it on the front page of the Columbia newspaper in Vancouver. One morning, you know, early June of 1989, I, I went out and got the newspaper. I sat down on the front porch. It was a beautiful, you know, June morning. So I, so I thought I'd sit there and look at the paper, right? I look at the headlines and it unfolded. I flipped it over and here's this big article right on the front page about this Bigfoot sighting. It happened uh, like three days previous. So I knew instantly everybody who saw the paper is interested in the subject. All the wannabes are going to race out there and they're going to, they're going to ruin the situation. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm going to go out and talk to the people anyway. And sure enough, I, I walked up when I got there because they gave the address and everything for these people. And, um, of course, you know, everybody, some bio, somebody who was a Bigfoot hunter claimed they were a biologist from Seattle had come there. And all these other people had showed up. And all they wanted was to record the people's story, look for footprints, Bigfoot poop or hair, and then off they went. <laughs> and, and, I, and I thought, well, okay. So I introduced myself, explained to the people that, you know, what I had seen when I was a teenager. And, and just the year before, I'd had a second sighting not far from there on the Washougal River, which is only a few miles from there. And uh, that sort of instantly built that rapport. So they said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll tell you what, uh, what we saw. So they explained to me, and I, I brought a whole bunch of show-and-tell stuff. So we were, we were looking at pictures and, and had a good discussion and I, and I asked him, I said, well, tell me what these other investigators did and asked. So they told me. And, and what was peculiar about that sighting, now, I'll, I'll go into it just a little bit. Uh, you know, since this family was brand new to the area, and we talked a little bit about the radishes and the farming, they had, the horse was tied up in the corral with a rope. And the lady of the house, Brenda, was going to go out and ride the horse, and her and her stepson, Nick, were sitting there watching TV, and then the horse started raising holy hell in the, in the, the corral. And this was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So she said, Nick, would you go out and see what's wrong with the horse? I don't want the horse, the rope getting in the horse's hooves and, and getting injured. So he went out there, and Nick told me what he thought he saw. Now, the corral had a, had a tree line on the, one, the left side, and it was all open on the right side, open pasture. And he thought he saw a person walking away from the corral down along the tree line to the lower pastures. So he went running after this person to uh, find out what the hell they were doing on their property. As he gets fairly close to this person, he slips and falls on a tree limb that was in the, the tall grass and made, made a bunch of noise. Well, he's only about 40 or 50 feet away from this thing at this point. And it turns around to hearing the noise to see what's behind it. And he said, then he sees what it is. And he said, he was trying to get up and he sees this, this huge creature there. And he said, its eyes got real big and it sort of reared its head back like this. Then it leaned forward to like it was trying to get a better look at him. 
He said, then it put its hands out, arms out at 45 degrees from its body, palms facing him, and started moving towards him. Well, he gets up and he runs like hell to the house, obviously. Well, in the meantime, when it took off, when he took off, the creature turned around and went back the direction it was going, the same direction. Nick slips on a better pair of boots, runs back out, and kind of the same thing happened. The thing hears him, and it turns around. This time, it didn't just try to hurt him. It come bearing after him. So he took off running. And he climbs up on a little outbuilding they had there. Now, mind you, neither time the, the creature tried to actually catch him. And nobody seemed to catch on to what was going on. It was trying to keep him away from something. Uh-huh. So I said, and now it waited. It waited for him up there to make sure it wasn't he wasn't coming back. And he said after a while it turned around and went right on the same direction it was going the first time. And I said, did any of these other so-called investigators go down the direction the creature went? Right. Now, nobody was interested. I said, do you mind if I go? And they said, sure, we'll take you down. So off we went down the same way the creature went. And in the lower fields, there was a big cottonwood tree that had blown over, as they do often, and this was a big one. It was probably three, four feet thick and with a big root wad standing up. And it was in a place where there had been kind of a seasonal pond. So there was a little dried mud there. And in that dried mud, there were all kinds of tracks of two young Sasquatches. Apparently, they'd been concealed in this position. And the adult male was trying to keep Nick a threat away from the young ones that were concealed. You know, and and so by by asking questions and listening to what they're saying and thinking about behaviors and why things happen and all the context, you know, and were other witnesses around, you know, I mean, you have to look at a, a much broader picture to really see because what happens with the report, they're simply a snapshot of a much bigger picture that's going on. And the more that you can expand that investigation around one sighting, and as Jeremiah found out, it, sometimes it opens up a huge can of worms. You find a ton of information, uh, and you can really start building the context of, of a situation and area, what's going on. Hey, well, let me let me jump in there for just a second, because sure. you said a couple of things that, that are key, <laughs> I think, that are key in, in this. And that's what I think Tom is going for, is trying to, to you know, data mine those gold nuggets that you sure. around in your <laughs> Or old or anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jay, your your mic. I think your microphone's having trouble. I can hardly hear you. Can you hear me? Put put it a little closer to you. Okay, I'm sorry. There you can go. You now? Much better. Uh, All right. This is. Uh, I'm. Uh, my tablet wasn't working on this, so I'm on my uh, smartphone trying to do this. So oh, I hear you. <laughs> Well, you got right, Jeremy so with that one. <laughs> no, his picture's locked up in his face, so that's a ghost Gerald, is uh, what I can tell. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you're interacting with, with these people. First of all, they don't know you. Uh, you're mm-hmm. trying to build a report. And, and the first thing is if they've never had an encounter before, which, you know, most people, it's a one time deal, you know. But, right. Uh, so they're probably in the same boat as everybody else is what what the heck is going on mm-hmm. and, and how do I find out more about what, what the subject is? So I think, uh, you know, he is giving them, like you said, you know, some of your experience, your tips, mm-hmm. things like that to say, don't change them. You know, if you still want interaction, you know, don't change the environment, whatever. Find out what their intent is. Are they scared? Do they not want them there? You know, are they trying to find out more information about it? That sort of thing. And right. Then, you know, help them with that. I think the, the real number here is when you said, uh, you know, show them some other evidence. You, you carried things with you, not just to build the, the build the relationship, but I can't tell you how valuable that would have been if somebody, you know, if let's say oh, yeah. I reported it, somebody came to interview me. The next thing I'm going to say is, show me what you got. You know, I, I had a shirt. I oh yeah, I brought a four inch binder that was full of stuff. And, and what we did was we sit and talked and I was able to answer their questions and show them examples of what I was talking about. 
you know, it was kind of a show and tell thing. And, and we really built that rapport. And, and I'll tell you, after there, there was a lot that happened that day. And afterwards, uh, they didn't want anyone else to have access yeah, to their see, property. It's let me take from you and let me leave. And right. then that leaves these people with a sense of helplessness because they aren't any farther along than they were to begin with. And right. And so, they so, and they didn't know what was going to happen next. That's what they were concerned about. And, and they were actually very worried about that. They said, Jesus, you know, this, this, we have no clue that anything like this existed. What do we do next? What if it comes back? And I was able to offer them some advice and a, a link to myself. I said, if, if I, and, and I told them, I said, now, you've seen an adult we found tracks of two young ones. I said, there's at least a female in the area, maybe more. If you, you, this is what you can possibly expect. If that happens, you know, I'm not too far away. Give me a call. And sure enough, within the month, uh, they did see female in the yard, standing there watching the house under one of the big out lights. So I was able to make predictions, and then those predictions happened. Uh, and there, were, there was a whole series of things that happened. I mean, it was an incredible uh, nine months that investigation even our own people i was telling tom uh you know at the time we had uh i had created one of the early organized efforts in this subject it was called the pacific Coast sasquatch investigation team and it was to this date I, I as far as i know the only nonprofit corporation devoted to proving these things were real and uh, and we did that basically to show people we were out to make bucks so um and it was a it was a you know a tr trust and confidence builder for us. So one of my uh, we had a board of directors and and two of the people on the board went out. We usually go out and meet and stay outside the people's property because we didn't want to intrude on their privacy in the evening. So we go out and listen to kind of monitor what was going on. And uh, Don Turner, a uh, good friend of mine, is gone now, but uh, Don. Um, had never seen one, wasn't really interested in the subject. His girlfriend, Carol, was our, our PR person. Uh, he used to come along just for her, but Don and I got to be pretty good friends, and Don was very, um, really sharp guy, very, I'd say, skeptical, the kind of skeptic I like who's sort of on the fence, but, you know, sort of a show me, and, and I'll be believe. Well, one evening before I got there, right before it got dark, um, Don... Uh, Don and Carol were in the car waiting, and, and Carol was in the back getting some snacks out. And he said, within 30 feet of his car, one of these things walked right in front of their car. <laughs> and so when I got there, he says, God damn it, Willie. He says, I knew eventually you were going to make a believer out of me. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and, and there was just, there were a lot of things that happened like that, you know, and, and again, you, you, when you, when you, and I, we go around and talk to people and, and, and disturbing these things. Now we talk, and then there's a whole lot of things we talk about with just that one thing, like with the, the whole radish thing. You know, we had a, 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 this PhD come out there, Mr. Genius, and uh, I won't go into everything that that idiot did, but uh, he introduced a bunch of, of food and things into the situation that we kept intact the whole time. And we were getting a lot of great results. These things were coming very close to us. I mean, we would hear them. And lots of people were having sightings there, uh, including our own people, tracks, the whole nine yards. This idiot brought a bunch of food and stuff out, made sexual advances to the, the gentleman's wife there, and, uh, you know, did a whole bunch of crap he should have been. He should have had my foot up his backside, but um, he didn't stick around long enough for me to get there. And anyway, uh, these things, it pissed them off they went to the neighboring farm completely tore their garden up and yeah. scared the people so bad they abandoned their farm mm. so when you when you when you look at the results of what can happen and again it's all part of this big thing if you there's a certain way to approach thing and and people and and that was the way i mean this guy definitely didn't know how to approach people uh, you know he began you know he had those three letters after his name so he thought he knew more than than we did so he found out differently <laughs> yeah, I like to kind of respond to Jay. Uh, you know, he's, he he has a lot of good uh, questions, and he has a lot of uh, 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 about 
asking people questions and stuff and how to approach them and stuff. One thing you also have to realize is that uh, if you've heard about that these people have seen a Sasquatch, um, then other people have too. So these people have heard a lot of ridicule, as we have. I know I have. And uh, so when you approach these people, understand they may have a wall that you're going to have to start shipping down. Right. And, and trust me, I've interviewed people before in, in the police department. You've got to approach them as you really care, and you care about them. And uh, I think your sincerity will come. It may That's take, very important. You know, it's very, yeah, it is very important. And it may take a little while, but you mm -hmm. just start a report, get that report going. You'll read it. You'll read it as soon as you're walking up to them, uh, whether yeah. or not they're going to talk to you or how friendly they are. They may be a little standoffish. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll direct what type of an approach you want to take toward these people. Right. But I think mm -hmm. You've got to approach these people sincerely. You understand what they're going through. You've 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 gone through what they have gone through, and, and just mm -hmm. basically want to get their story. And uh, yeah, you know, you could go to a traffic accident and get nine different different uh, testimonies from different people that seen the same thing. You know, uh, time makes a big difference. The longer it takes to mm -hmm. get out of the story, you know, things may add or delete from it. You know, so you're basically you got to read between the lines, you know, and take the story as as it comes, and uh, and relate it as they tell it to you. But you got to you know intelligently look between the lines to see what possibly has happened. I think what you did, Bill, by asking, don't taking it a step farther, and hey, take me to it. That well, now that. here's here, here's something that you made me think about. Now this is important too, if you're able to do this now. Obviously, you know, if a story happened 20 years ago, it may be very difficult to do this, but not, not impossible. If the person is close to where the area is where this happened, take them out there and have them go step by step and do it in small steps as the situation unfolded. Because a lot of times it'll jog their memory. Like Jay said, there, there are certain yeah. things it could be and it could even be things like the amount of sunlight the smells, things like that, temperature, that'll jog their memories. Um, you know, if, if it can be arranged on on the very similar kind of a day that the situation happened, for instance, that might really enhance a person's memory. There's a lot of little gimmicks you can do, but, but the basic thing is trying to get to the real uh, nuts and bolts of what happened. And not just with that particular person, but you have to look at the bigger picture. What's the history of things that have happened in that, area, in that area? Were there patterns before? Are people currently still seeing things? Are they seeing the same things? Um, let's let's touch on that just for a second, yeah. because that was kind of the next bullet here. Was you know we go into the previous knowledge and we gather their encounter or their experience, but evidence collection. Um, you know, one thing that, that you know we you know forensic collection in the military if you're doing site exploitation mm -hmm. or things like that. Is and, and you know I'm part of the police force. I'm not uh, associated with the police department at all, but uh, you don't want to contaminate the evidence and you don't want to contaminate the scene, which is difficult. Absolutely. To do. So if you take something out, I can imagine you walk them back through a scenario to try and pinpoint where the majority of the activity is. Mm -hmm. But when you when you're actually going to collect the scene, uh, you know there's two approaches, maybe more, but there's two that I'm aware of. One is gridding an area. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you establish your grid, you potentially contaminate the area. Right, so, exactly. So into an area that you haven't been to before and you're worried about um, getting too close to it, then you establish a, uh, a circumference that's mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And you take pictures of that whole area, 360. And not just people tend to focus on the evidence itself. They tend to... you got to have the context. Area. You need to get the footprint. You know, you need to go to the to the micro and the macro, and then turn around, and take pictures of landmarks in that vicinity as well, mm -hmm. so you can go back. If you had to go do a follow up, find that same location, and then you walk the perimeter, you know, say 100 meters, and very carefully, you know, look for you know anything that could be disturbed that might lead you in another area, whatever, 
and then slowly work your way toward uh, wherever that, that you know tangible uh, piece of evidence might be, and and you mark them whether it's uh, you know with, uh, you mark your flag. Or, it's know, it's one of the one of the things I'm actually going to cover in one of the next uh, I don't know volumes eight or nine of the Bigfoot Fieldwork 101 is about how to actually collect evidence. Well, the one I'm working on right now is like is searching areas. The, the one of the next ones is going to be actual evidence collecting. And and you're right. It's one of those things you really have to. And what I used to use as an example was uh, when I was in college, I went to the archaeological field school and actually got hired on a couple of digs after that. It was really fun. But when and it's exactly that you're you have to you have to gather the context of the area something you know of course and you you add the history and stuff later but uh gridding the area and being being extremely scientific about it because what you want to be able to do is have the information collected in such a way that anyone in the future could recreate what you documented in a lab to the exact measurements and and that way, then the information is valuable scientifically down the road after you're say long gone. Uh, and like I was telling Tom yesterday, I said, you know, what I want for us to do, and and I guess I should touch real quickly. Uh, Robert asked a question: what our mission statement was, uh, or our goal. And it's quite simply two words. You know, it's issue resolution. That's it. We're out. We're out to resolve the issue. That's what that's what this group is about. Uh, so. The procedures are going to, we'll try to adapt those now, whether it's police, military, archaeological, we can have a, can blend all of those together. I think a lot of them are very close in their procedures. Um, and that's something that we as a group need to actually decide on how, how exactly we want to do that. But we want to, uh, you know, whatever we do in the, say, the next 10 years with this subject, uh, you know, if we, if we say, if we prove these things were real, Whatever we do 50 years from now could be used by scientists uh, to recreate. Do you have a recommended uh, toolkit, so to speak? I mean, is that, I, I, I ordered some of your books. I haven't got them yet, but, you yeah. know, because I've, I've never used a footprint. So oh, would be absolutely. Actually, I will, do that. I will send you. I imagine you'd want to take Ziploc bags, you know, and oh, things I'll, like that. With you. I'll, I'll tell you what, I will. I will send you. In fact, for for our regionals, I'll send you guys the uh, the PDFs for each of the books, and in some additional I just, I and, some, and and some additional <laughs> some additional information also. You know that's it's not included in those because uh, Eric Garcia is one of our one of our guys in uh, the Southern California team, and Eric's actually getting his PhD currently in uh, in forensic work. So he recommended some some evidence collecting kits that are already put together, and they're relatively inexpensive. So uh, in in uh, in conjunction with some of the things that I recommended in the first volume. Uh, some very basic things that I think everybody, if you're going to go out and look for Sasquatches, there's some things you should have. Uh, and evidence collection is, is an important one. There's a lot of people. And first of all, let me let me hit on, on the whole DNA thing. Uh, if, if anybody out there listening thinks that DNA is going to prove these things are real, it's, it's not. Because, uh, and I, I won't mention our, our gentleman's name in the Southwest, who's a police officer. Uh, and he's also retired military. Uh, special forces so good guy knows his stuff a buddy of his and this happened i told tom this there was a situation that happened there was actually a whole bunch of ongoing situations and jay you know who he is i, I told you earlier uh, there was a situation where there was there was a bunch of these things that happened these incidents that were kind of a chain of, of incidents that happened and one of them involved a 15 year old boy who was riding his bike home one evening uh and the area, apparently the county doesn't have a lot of money, so they only put street lights along the roads where there's danger points, curves, things like that, where there might be potential accidents. So uh, the kid was happened to get the feeling he was being followed, so he stopped under one of these street lights, and he looked behind him, and here's this massive creature on all fours, and he said it was right around six or seven feet high, even on all fours. And he, of course... Had an underwear changing moment, tried to take off on his bike. The thing reached out and grabbed the bike. The kid went flying over the handlebars and got up and took off running for home. And he got home in a state of panic. 
parents got him calmed down. He told them what he saw. They called 911. So the sheriff's department came out. And the sheriff, deputy sheriff was a little skeptical, obviously. And the kid said, you know, basically, screw you. I know what I saw. You know, so the deputy says, okay, let me, let's go back out to the place where this happened. Let me take a look around. So they got back out there. They found his bike 10 feet up a tree with the frame bent. And we, I've told the story before on a couple of podcasts, but I didn't really include the full details because there was blood on the bike where the creature grabbed it, apparently cut its hand and, and quite a bit of blood. So the deputy took a sample and sent it in for what they call, uh, I think, the cheap test or the quick test or whatever. He just wanted to make sure it wasn't some buddy who was maybe, you know, child molester or whatever in their database. And the lab inadvertently screwed up uh, and did a full spectrum analysis on the blood. And instead of, you know, it being $20, it was something like $20,000. And and it, and it took a year. It took a year for the test to get back. So the sheriff kind of went ballistic and telling the deputy saying, what the hell is all of this about what you sent us in for? And he says, look, I, I hear that's documented. I only sent it in for the cheap test. So the bottom line is the results came back. Uh, and it came back unknown primate, but that's the, really the best. That's really the best a DNA test is going to do with one of these things. So, I, I'm not particularly interested in that. I mean, I, I have an outfit in Canada who will do a, a DNA test for about a thousand dollars. So, if, if we happen to come up with something, we can get it tested. But really, all all a DNA test is going to do for our purposes, it's not going to prove these things are real. It's just like the whole dermal ridge thing and all this other crap that's gone on the last twenty years. All these these geniuses out there, they'll take one little piece of the whole picture and they think they've solved it. Well, you know, uh, something DeHinden told me years ago, he said, you can have, you know, 100 pictures or 100 films of these things and the general public still isn't going to buy it. Uh, What it's going to take. The whole whole premise for that is your analysis is only as good as your database. Absolutely. And and everybody thinks we that DNA is a magic bullet. Well, we've studied human beings a whole lot, so we know a lot about us. But when you look at the rest of the DNA database, there isn't a whole lot there. I mean, you know, science, science has studied some animals, but again, you, you have to, like you said, you have to know a little bit more about that uh, for it to really, to have the meaning. You know, so you can't just plug any little thing in the DNA database and pull out a magic bullet. When people come back and they say, you know, oh, well, it's it's human DNA, immediately they think it's contamination. Right. The right. That totally in, in the scientific world, you know, they're, it's very easy to dismiss, just like, you know, photos, videos. Absolutely. Tape, everybody, in, you know, while I were talking about this earlier, where people just go, you know, the average person is going to go, Oh, that's Photoshop, or that's uh, you right. know, some somebody's CGI that not understanding, you know, what it really takes to do CGI to that level yeah. to make it look like a natural creature in the wild. You know? Right. Uh, you know, that's what, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of these things take a, a little bit more scrutiny. You know, people out there they just kind of they like to be. Uh, what was the term? There used to be a term for it when I was in the military. The pablum pukers or whatever people are just they like to be fed bullshit you know and yeah. and will believe whatever's on whatever's on on the thin surface and 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 if you know we, you know we we have one of the most marvelous tools on the planet this little thing up here that's used most often as a hat rack and and we really ought to use that to dig a little bit deeper in, in before we make a, a you know conclusion about something you know so yeah i mean and and it could be well, now, in some of those cases, you know, I know there's, you know, like the whole Mel Ketchum thing, and I don't even want to get into that because that's a whole nightmare, that whole deal. <laughs> but I, I know, you know, I can just, I've seen it on TV where people go out and they find a hair on a tree, and what do they do? They grab it with their fingers and they stuff it in their pocket. Mm-hmm. Well, God only knows what sort of contaminants are in it. And then when and I talked to, when I wrote notes in the field, I, I talked to a... Um, an expert up in Edmonton, uh, and he uh, apparently there was there was a recent Bigfoot sighting up there in that part of Canada, and uh, the the people who claimed they saw the creature sent some of the hairs to the facility he worked at, and he did the test and he and it came back buffalo hair, so I found his information and called him and we had a nice chat because I wanted people to understand from a professional 
about how DNA worked. And, and he explained a lot of this to me about how uh, if it's if it's something now, something like this, an unknown primate, he says that's the best that's going to come up because it may have certain markers that are going to be similar, you know, that are recognized as primate. But beyond that, because they it hasn't been studied, they wouldn't know. And there's also, um, we talk about like collecting information. There's a chain of custody issue. If you don't take a sample directly off the body, how in the hell do you know what it came off from? There is no way to know that. Well, you have to corroborate the evidence. And, and even <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, I, I used to do uh, uh, urinalysis and stuff like that, you know, in, in the military. Sure. And, and when you're dealing with even things like uh, uh, sampling blood uh, for, you know, there's gas spectroscopy that, that's conducted. And I think it's nine different types of gas that have to be administered to the sample at yeah. very specific uh, <clears throat> right uh, to come up with your result. So it's one of those where you know, you know, it sounds good on the outside, and then it's uh, it's a, it does a science. But when you actually talk to the scientists that conduct that, you know, yeah. they're, they're like, it's no. To, right. Ninety-five you percent know, <laughs> of whatever until they get an actual sample that they can pull something off of. And right. A lot of and times I, they have to culture that so many times to get something viable off of it that you know they. Yeah. You know, and people. That's really, what we're talking about because if you can, yeah. like, go into your pictures and you go, I put it in the question mark column. Interesting. Right. You know, it's interesting. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> take a report and, and a picture and match it to a footprint and there's some scat or whatever or a, a track trail and you can put that on a map and then over time well i'm gonna let me, i'll continue just real quick because that kind of sparked my brain here. so in evidence some of the things that i'm picking up on here you, you know you gotta you got it's all gamuts take pictures write it down draw a picture whatever you need to do you know, grid it off, scale it, and, and ask them to walk you through that so that you can yeah. get the map from you. Um, use a scale object. I don't know how many pictures I've seen that people have sent to me or that I've seen on the internet where it's a picture of a footprint, it's a picture of something. One of the right, and, and it's worthless. With an arm, with somebody's arm pointing at right, it. right. And I looked at that and I thought, I've just shown that picture to a couple people and went, I'm not even going to tell you what I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and the caption under the picture is now we know why Bigfoot screams <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then you can have the, the, the kind of intellectual conversation towards about all the volume and the diameter and yeah. all those things whether it's protein or you know, whatever's in it you can have those discussions after you oh you yeah know, yeah. They just look at that and go what you know what? What could possibly because if yeah, you didn't it, have it in there for scale, okay, it's a, it's a big pile. Of, you know, sure, it doesn't. It, and you know, one of the habits we used to have the old the old timers and this stuff was always sticking your foot next to the track. Yeah, you know, I mean that's that's the easy one. You put your foot right. up there and you're like, well, I know how big my foot is, so here's what we can show. But yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things, you know. We we can we can do another whole show on on evidence and how to deal with that. But uh, we're actually running out of time on this one. But uh, eventually, I, I think, eventually, what I would like to be able to do is is you know once we get the database up, can I say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hold on, hold on, Joe. Uh, once we get the database up and running, I'd like to be able to you know put pins on a map digitally, you know, and. Mm -hmm. Say, okay, here's the locations because in the military, in the army, I yeah, work in intelligence. This is what we did. You know, you mm -hmm. would, you would uh, make pattern wheel, and a pattern wheel sure. is simply, you know, the hours of the clock face. If you picture a clock face that looks like a circle, right? so you've got, you know, 12 o'clock all the way around back to 12 o'clock, so 12, 3, 9, whatever. And then you go from the inside for dates, and you carry that right. out on whatever scale you want to work days. So you start and you have one in the middle and you go all the way out to 30 days or whatever. Mm -hmm. and happen, you can you can plot you movements. Those and you say this is this is incident number one. And you, right. text, you write out every detail that went with it so you've got the intelligence report. And then you, mm -hmm. and you give it that number. And then you put it on the time.
time wheel, and over time you start to develop patterns of, you know, here's some activity, and then you start asking yourself the questions of, okay, why is that happening in that time span where it's an hour before? Right. And then you can look at where it's going on on the map, and you can start doing some predictive analysis. Um, Absolutely. Or where you think they might be, or why, and maybe position yourself that way. So that it's, mm -hmm. Right. And and we can do that. We're not we're not hearing you, Jay. Hey, can I say something real, real quick? Oh, there you go. Okay. Go ahead, Gerald. Hey, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, if you're fortunate enough to be in an area where you know that you've had activity, Robert, Damon, and I, we uh, have spent a lot of money this year preparing for this year because we know we they're in a hunting corridor. And I don't care who believes whatever evidence we're able to collect this year. You know, we just want to do it for us. You know what I mean? Uh, we've got numerous cameras, <laughs> recordings. We've got, we're going to be doing DNA traps. We're going to be, a, because this corridor is so important for them to hunt, mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to set up cameras to where the, there's no way if they want to avoid one, we're going to really check this infrared out. I'm going to tell you that right now. And uh, we're going to have cameras up high, down low, uh, we're going to get the evidence this year. I, I, I'm almost certain, just like we did last year. I'm sure the, those pictures that Robert had uh, got on his trail mm -hmm. cam here. That was Whistler. He's the one that likes to whistle. Uh, whatever evidence, I don't care if anybody wants to believe me or not, or Robert. We don't care. We, we're going out there to, to, to uh, get evidence to secure us. We know. We want to prove it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. well, Seeing what we're hearing, what we're experiencing is true, and let the chips fall where they may. You know, is he's, uh, he's in Southwest Washington. Okay, uh, Pacific. Actually, he's not far from where we did all our investigations. You know, back in Yakult in that area. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I live on the Washougal River. Okay. No, well, not too far from it, anyway. Well, well, fellas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and wrap this up for this time. I think we should uh, maybe continue this conversation next week. What do you guys think? Uh, hopefully, I'm, I'm not working. Okay, not well, if not, we'll, we need to get Jeremiah on, too, because I'd like to have all three regional directors on so we can kind of continue talking about, you know, what goes into reporting. And, and again, it's a lot more than just, you know, we see reports all over the Internet. And these different groups and things, those are those are very basic, I would call beginners reports, because when you when you really investigate a, a situation and, and you guys know from doing this already, uh, you can unearth a whole lot more information. And there are definitely techniques to use to get to that. And uh, and it's definitely what we want to do. So. Well, um, where's Jay from? Uh, I'm I'm in Alabama right now, so I'm I'm kind of the south southeast. Yeah, Jay covers the southeastern quarter of the United States, and Tom, since we don't have a regional director in the um, the southwest, Tom is covering the western United States, and Jeremiah is our northeast uh, director. And that's something I've talked to you you three guys too also about. Um, we need to kind of draw lines, I guess, you know, quarter of the country, so everybody knows where their where their area is, you know kind of your 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 boundary so if people join up they know which one of you guys they report to uh so but we'll talk about all that tomorrow when we do our uh our skype call and uh so anyway oh, T, uh, our buddy uh tw made it and craig knock 
<laughs> so let me wrap this up, fellas. We'll uh, we'll continue this chat on reporting next week, I think, because it's important. It's important, and I think it's something we should we should do a little bit more talking about. So, thanks everyone for joining us this week, and uh, join us again next week, next Thursday for the next edition. We're going to talk about reporting some more. Uh, check the website out, williamjevning.com. Go on Facebook, look at our um, group page, the JRG uh, Bigfoot Research page. We've got uh, quite a few people join up on the website and uh, get a hold of one of us. Go on the pages. Now, since we are starting to have the pages up and also the regional directors are having their own pages up there, uh, if that's the part of the country you're in and you want to either join one of the teams or... Uh, make your own team. Get a hold of one of those people, and we'll get you set up and going. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Later. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks for, uh, what their knowledge was and what you know interest is and all that. Right, and to see if they're putting any artificial information from their mind, their frame of reference, into the story they're telling. You know, before all this stuff got really public, there wasn't all that. So the information, and I think we talked about, like pre-Bluff uh, Creek. You know, prior to that, there wasn't a lot of information out there. So when the person related a story, it was pretty much what they experienced, what they saw. After that time, and since then, the more stuff gets out in the public uh, venue, you know, even, and, and, I, and Tom and I talked about this, when you, even when somebody, let's say they're totally disinterested in the subject, right? They walk by a television finding Bigfoot's on, and maybe they see something for 10 or 15 seconds. It still gets in here. It's embedded, even if they don't consciously realize that information went in because they heard it, they saw it, it was recorded. So when a situation happens, they're in that situation. When they go to relay that situation, whatever pieces they picked up get plugged into what it is they're telling. And that's an artificial piece of information that's part of that whatever happened uh it's how they it's how they're able to you know relay that situation by using those things that they have in their frame of reference i think it's interesting whenever you go to finding bigfoot stuff it's always whoa <laughs> you know it's more than kind of recorded thing it's all total like crap <laughs> nothing like what i heard yeah but i've listened to you know many of the stuff Chronicles episode that you were on before, and I can't tell you how many of those sighting reports. The second part of what I heard was that deep guttural growling. <laughs> red deep the yeah. To this high pitch, now eerie banshee, which like scream. That was the second part of what I heard. Exactly. It was very primate. It was very ape like. It was that wolfing. And and that's the way. That's the way the vocals have been described for decades as they start out with that low rumbling kind of growl and then work up to that high pitched scream. And and it's what I've heard many times in the field. I mean I've heard a lot of different vocals, but that's the most common one. Yeah. But you know, that to me that you know, when I when I hear that it's it's like okay, somebody's not you know, and I've heard recordings played, uh, uh, you know, that, that to me I'm going, that's a person. Absolutely. You know, definitely outside of the realm of human capability. There's no way that, that yeah. a human being one can, can span that vocal range. But well, I'm not going to bring off here. <laughs> we just say the subject matter. I'm starting to have a hard time. Robert, Robert. Hey, hey Jay, may I ask one question, guys? I just wanted to inter interject and sort of elaborate on, on what Jay was saying <laughs> to, to bridge the two things. Uh, I put over in the, the notes in the chat one of the uh, a reference to the almanac and the reason for that is and i just wanted to highlight something that jay said which was gathering the the demographics and just the basic information mm -hmm. well when jeremy went to talk to this witness this particular incident happened uh in 1988 mm -hmm. and so some of the details were missing mm -hmm. but what what detail was the two details that were relevant were that she knew the month that mm -hmm. this happened and didn't know if it was the beginning or the end of the month and didn't know what day of the week it was, but she did know what the weather was like, the temperature, and she also knew the uh, what the state of the moon was. So she said the moon was almost full or it was very bright. 
and it was uh, a certain temperature. Now, if you go back, I have in the almanac, you can do a historical weather search. Exactly. And, so you can, and so we. And there's this, another, we, and there's another important component to that verification. You know, and I've made the mistake myself in recent times by not going back and utilizing that particular information that's out there, weather, moon and sun condition, things like that, to verify a story uh, and found out later that, you know, the witness described those things was not what those conditions were. So, you know, it's it also can, it can help you pinpoint information and it helps you verify what that person said. So very two very important components there. And you never know, as you say, when what's going to be relevant. Like you told, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Will was telling me some of his witness eyewitness accounts, and there was a, a detail about this particular family just be being new to farming. Oh, and then also the the radishes. Yeah. Could could you tell that really quickly, the radish story? Well, you know, now this was this was the Goldhammer incident back in 1989, and I and I, it's you know what the book Haunted Valley was about. Um, when I went there, now the, those folks were brand new from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, were city people, had never lived in the country. They bought 13 acres south of the town of Yakult, and that's a little place out in the middle of nowhere. There's Gerald knows, you know, it's built up a little now, but it's still kind of out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And uh, that part of the Akholt Valley, most of the people who lived there were older folks in those days, so they didn't utilize their acreage. So nobody went out in the valley in that part of the, of the area. So these folks bought 13 acres, and they decided they were going to try their hand at all kinds of things. So they bought a horse, and they tried they fighting uh, a lot of peripheral things. And then you have to match up. You know, you start, you start getting pieces from uh, the surrounding area. You know, we talk about, like, uh, other witnesses in the area and things like that. So uh, I'll let you guys go ahead and uh, and start that. Let me try to bring on. I guess I can bring on Gerald. Uh, since mind if I just kind of go on down my little list of of uh, you know kind of what I was gathering from that and, sure. and see, get you guys input on it. You know, in the military, I'm of course you know old time army guy. You know, we used what was called and Tom and I've talked quite a bit about this. Some. Uh, on our own uh, in the last couple of days, uh, but used a uh, spot report, a salute report, you know, just a generalized, which is, you know, size, activity, time, location, unit, and all that kind of stuff that doesn't apply to this, but just trying to keep a, a general framework. So what I was hearing uh, from the interview are, are some key tenants that you do, and this is, the, you know, some of the things you do in human intelligence when you go out and you deal with somebody. First of all, you have to understand your subject. You have to understand the the potential uh, psychological frame of mind they might be in. A lot of people are apprehensive. I mean, thinking about, you know, I, I know I had a particular uh, encounter and, and embarrassing sometimes to talk about uh, <laughs> dealing with people. Um, but, you know, being, you know, number one is probably being respectful. Uh, letting them know that you're not going to be done. you know, trying to, uh, you know, build that rapport, that connection with them. And, and, and all I would say is you, know, you want to open it up and be respectful. You let them know you're not there to judge them. Uh, potentially let them know, you know, if you've had one, to say, you know, hey, I'm not just interested. I'm one of you. You know, I've, I've been there. I know how you're feeling. And you connect with uh, because to be honest with you, before I talk to you, Will, there's only one other person I talked to who actually heard what I heard, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that felt like it almost, it was such a, a weight off of me to know that there was somebody else out because everybody else does the kind of, you know, big sigh. Or and that's very common. Plausible. Right. And, and they lean more toward, they trust your character, but they still just kind of go, well, you know, I'm a skeptic, I don't know. So, exactly. You can't really, unless you, unless you've had some kind of experience like that, it's really difficult to, you know, sort of meet that other person eye to eye. Uh, you can't really make a connection with them. And I know I've, I've gotten instant rapport with many, many witnesses because what I, I'll say, I'll start talking within 30 seconds. They know that I saw what they saw and vice versa. Right. You know, it, it's, I mean, not all of, all of us, you know, have that experience. Tom doesn't yet. Of course, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to break his cherry on that one at some point, but, uh, 
<laughs> we'll get you an underwear changing moment there, Tom. You got to gotta let, you, you gotta let people know before you go out, and then we'll just check. Because if you just go off the net for a long time, we'll just have to put you in that missing four one. That's right. We'll know. We'll know what happened. <laughs> but you. Uh, so be respectful, you know, let them know that you're not, that you're not there to judge. And we do this with soldiers when we're interviewing them yeah. to let them know, because, you know, people are especially soldiers, but people in general want to be reviewed, viewed and remembered in a positive way. Absolutely. And so there's always a fear of being viewed negatively. So when you, mm -hmm. you know, not only, you know, am I not here to judge you, but you're also potentially helping uh, add to the body of knowledge on the stuff. So then they're participating, not just recalling something and you're, you're kind of just, you know, taking a police report, mm -hmm. you know, so it, you know, sometimes you can get people more interactive with you. If you say, look, you don't have to be a scientist. We're just trying to get the details of what it is. One thing Tom said the other day that I just, uh, I really took interest to is that he recommend that you take somebody back in time earlier that day and, and they start recalling things because, you know, it, and cognition, you know, they tend to, um, uh, you know, we associate memories with uh, multiple senses. That's real. Right. So, you know, if you're somebody that's a stroke victim and they can't, you know, they, they regain some ability, but they have difficulty finding words mm -hmm. and, and senses because they've lost the connection to whatever it was. Maybe they remembered something and they associate it with orange. Right. You know, or a piece of silverware or something, you know, and they can't think of the name of that object. You have to literally pick up an object. Right. And, and say what the real name is over and over and over again with an unlike object in their hand mm -hmm. so that they and they register it in a different neural pathway. Exactly. So, you, know, you know, I think that's excellent having them go back to a, a point in time earlier that day that's totally unrelated to that right. traumatic event. And that's, and that's what I talked about with Tom yesterday. I said, first of all, when I interview somebody, I have them tell me about what they were doing before the incident took place. And then later on, now you can either do it the same day or later, uh, because you, you, if you get, hey, there's Gerald, uh, with a witness. Now, if you get a good, a really good, interesting situation that happened, uh, down the road, you can go and talk to the person and talk to them about something completely unrelated. You're talking cars, you know, the dog, whatever. And and oftentimes through the course of a, a totally unrelated conversation, things will hit their memory. And and they'll say, wow, I remembered this piece. Like you said, Jay, because something will jog their memory in something that's totally unrelated, but it, it makes a connection in those neural pathways. So... And especially if it was something that was two or more sensory inputs, it really bonds it much stronger in their minds. Yeah, when, when people have traumatic events, things like that, you can resolve this issue very quickly by releasing a start time safety in the background. Gerald, do you have a TV on? <laughs> yeah, hold on. I'll, uh, I'll go to the other room. Okay, I can, I can hear that. I can hear Jim. I can hear your TV. <laughs> I was listening to the debate. So then, so then you, uh, uh, that's not important. This is a much more important subject. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I apologize. We have an ability to influence this process, not necessarily that one. But, uh, so, okay. So you, you know, be respectful, make a connection, uh, let them know they're being, they're part of, uh, you know, the solution process. That way they, they join in the positive framework mm -hmm. and, and they view themselves as positive. Um, uh, smile, you know, I, I'm mm -hmm. not a big smiler, but you know, smile what's important to keep yourself positive. <laughs> uh, That's right. You know, there are, look, I'm in North Alabama, you know, there's places here I go, and, you know, both real names for everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, you go rolling up in somebody's yard and they've got six dogs and nine kids and, you know, mm -hmm. and to their front porch, you know, they're, they're looking at you like, you know, who, who are you at, you know, are you the IRS? I mean, you know, right, right. 
if you start a, if they're cold calling and you start a conversation with somebody, but it's interesting how they will open up to you if you can find a common ground. I, I talked Absolutely. to a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I noted that the woman was because I, I went to follow up on something. Uh, a guy told me about somebody he grew up with that was from a, a local town. He said, you know, the guy did tend to drink a lot, but I went and saw him. But I asked him if there were other places or people in the area, and he said, well, just drive down this other road. All those people are friendly down through there, mm-hmm. and it's kind of near, near uh, uh, you know, they called it the creek thing or the slough thing. Sure. Thing, T-H-A-N-J. Uh, <laughs> I saw some folks down there. Sure, so that's what they call it, T-H-A-N-J. <laughs> Uh, so, so I, I saw these folks stand up in front of their house, and I, I passed it by, and I thought, no, you know what? They, I'm gonna go talk to them. They got a bunch of little kids, you know. That kind of noise tends to potentially attract these, you know, mm-hmm. things in. And let me go see. So I went up there and I was wearing an army jacket, and I happened to have a airborne shirt. And, and, hey, you know, here's my name. This is what I'm doing. You know, interested. So they got the army thing, and then we kind of talked about that at first. And they started talking about, yeah, we've been hearing these these female type screams coming from behind our house. My and their only son wasn't there at the time, and he had pictures of an odd footprint and some claw marks they found up in a tree and some other things. So I haven't uh, I haven't got that evidence yet, hmm. uh, but it, but it's anyway, you know, so you open up to them, get that going. Then when, when we go into collecting reports, uh, I would really want to take some baseline demographic. Uh, one get the daytime group, uh, number of witnesses, perhaps, you know, perhaps gender. Uh, I call it the environmental, you know, weather, illumination, mm-hmm. basic layout of the terrain. Right. And then, you know, geographic location. And, and I've sent Tom and Will, you both, uh, and, and Daniel, one guy, and just some general kind of bullets of, of the general scenario of what happened and saving it as a jpeg and it may just be an addition that we put into the database or something so, you know when you think about it, like i was trying to jot out when tom was talking about that report uh because you know i'm interested even though that's not my region i'm interested in in you know pulling up those those areas and road intersections like you and i were talking well about that research that mm-hmm. That 911 call from the homeless woman. She said, "You know, we, we were near this highway that and near this road intersection." I'm like, "I can look that up." Sure. So I looked it up. Google Earth it dropped the, uh, you know, the Google Map, uh, you know, Street View. Could see the water towers. Could see the wood line. You know, and and you know, in this, so you could kind of look at the lay of the land. Right. And then when you zoom out, you're like, man, that, you know, that's an urban area. There's there's a lot of houses that's kind of close to being in town, and I'm thinking, you know, that people would dismiss that and say that's not possible mm-hmm. here, or there, but then you know, we're only talking, uh, you know, a few miles from <laughs> right you know, other places. But anyway, so you know, gathering some of uh, you know baseline demographic, take time groups, some environmental location, um, you know, take a little. Uh, page out of Will's book, you know, what's your previous knowledge on the subject to establish kind of a baseline of, of good. All right, everyone, welcome again to this week's edition of the uh, Bigfoot um, Notes from the Field. We have uh, actually all three of our um, regional directors on this evening, so uh, David's in the in the background listening in, so, uh, and Gerald, sorry we didn't get you on, man, we get, we'll try to get people on as we can. We only have room for four, four spots in here. But uh, so let me start out like we usually do with a little bit of uh, news going on. And of course, this is where this is where I get to plug my own stuff. So I, I published my 10th book yesterday. All right. uh, it's available on it's available on Kindle. Now, this is this was a project that I sort of played with for the past few years. And it's just been kind of sitting there in a file for a while. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I decided to drag it out and, and continue on with it and finish it up and get it out of my hair, So, which there isn't a lot of. So, you know, uh, one less thing to hang up there. But anyway, uh, and and the, yeah, there we go. See, and, and uh, the Bigfoot 101 
our Bigfoot Fieldwork 101 books, I'll be getting back on those and uh, getting the other four wrapped up. Okay, we'll bring try Gerald again. I'll be trying to get those wrapped up here as soon as possible so that all 10 of those are published. Um, so we were going to talk about uh, reports and reporting tonight. And, and Tom and I spent almost four hours on Skype yesterday talking about this, uh, among other things. But um, one of the things we talked about was, and, and Tom, I'm going to go ahead and let you pick it up from here, you know, because you had a lot of great questions. And, um, you know, doing a reporter, collecting a Bigfoot report is a lot more than just, you know, going and talking to a witness and, and recording what they had to say because, uh, there's there's a great deal more you can do with that. And in fact, Jeremiah, whenever we can get him back on, uh, he had an individual. No, it was or was it you? I can't remember. It was one of you two that had an individual, and there turned out to be a whole. Maybe it was Jeremiah. A lot more information about it. I told him to keep digging, and and pretty soon the whole thing really mushroomed, uh, and there was just a, a ton more information that came out, uh, you know, surrounding that. So Tom, go ahead and. Uh, uh, Let's I'll let you go ahead and uh, pick it up here about interviewing. All right. Yeah. And so I had something similar to you guys. And what I had was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my team member, Jeremy Benson, he's in the northern part of Idaho. He interviewed a witness and it was one of those reports that was a peripheral report. So by peripheral, we're saying it wasn't a direct sighting, but there were a number of coincidence or incidents that happen mm -hmm. as part of this report and i think it's it's a fascinating example of how something that seems maybe innocuous at the time especially to the person when you go back and really investigate it and look at what's happening around the mm -hmm. area or what has happened around that area you may begin to see a pattern emerge and that's this is the case uh, this particular incident uh, again jeremy benson took this statement and interviewed this person who had a series of encounters in 1988 and it was well they were living in while well, this person was living in washington state so one of the regions that's closer to uh, uh thorfinn's realm, his area in northern Washington, it was in Snohomish County. And what had happened it was that it was it was a young mother. She was a 23-year-old woman, 1988, mm -hmm. and they were camping around the northern part, outside of Granite Falls, about 21 miles west of Granite Falls at a place called the Big Four Ice Caves. So that's a, a fairly popular spot. And what they decided to do as a family was to camp not near the campground by the Big Four Ice Caves, but they made their own way. So they took Mountain Loop Highway, which is north of the Big Four Ice Caves, and they parked along the side of the road and they hiked in. They hiked in about, well, about four and a half miles or so and found a suitable campsite. And in the process, they met another family. So this was a woman, uh, a husband, and three children. It was a, a man, the, um, the young boy was eight, and then he had an older sister and a, and a younger sister. And what happened was they, after they set up camp in this re very remote place, they did meet another couple coming in. They did some camping with them. It was quite a remote place. There weren't any other campers around. And there was a river that was uh, close by. It was the Stilguamish River, the South Fork of the Stilguamish River. And they, they were parked, they were camped alongside that river. Well, they went out during the day for a day hike along the river and noticed almost instantly a putrid smell. And it was an, you know, an odd, strange uh, scent. And they thought for a moment they'd camp near some rotting carcass so they were they were concerned that you know maybe they were in a bear kill area or there was something something there but the smell went away and uh then it re-emerged again as they hiked along the river but what they found which was really curious was a tree about eight feet tall a, a young tree that had several salmon whole salmon 
stuck at, in the top of the tree and the, the salmon was fairly fresh so it hadn't yet rotted mm. and it was uh, <laughs> so it wasn't desiccated and, and stinking and, and decomposing it was still fairly fresh and they thought that was the the oddest thing they couldn't they couldn't explain that they didn't understand how a bear could have done that or or even a cat it just looked odd now at the time none of them thought bigfoot that wasn't on their mind and they had some it, it turns out when he, this fellow interviewed these this this woman she had heard of bigfoot but hadn't really uh, thought about it as much uh, being in that area and didn't know anything about the standard Bigfoot behaviors that you hear about now on television, you know, so it wasn't so widely publicized. Right. And she was a, they were outdoors people. So they were campers, hunters, fishermen. And they were familiar with the, the wildlife and that particular area. And what they thought it was could have been a bear. Well, anyway, later on that day, they just passed it on and thought it was a strange kind of bizarre incident, but uh, let it go. And they went and camped. And that evening, the husbands went into town to go get some supplies and the wives built up the campfire. And then the stink started to come through again. And they you know, thought, oh no, what, what's this? And it, it came and it passed again. Uh, and then all of a sudden they heard knocking noises. And so they heard a noise that they described as a tree on tree, someone hitting a tree. And this happened back and forth in the several times over the course of, it was about 40, 45 minutes that this went on, this knocking back and forth. And then they, it ended it, with a crescendo of footfalls, big steps and crashing through the forest around the area. And this woman was was frightened, but she still, she didn't understand what the knocking was all about. Uh, it, was, it was, again, just kind of wrote it off as odd and figured that perhaps the footfalls could have been a bear, could have been some other big, big animal. But she said it was, they were loud and uh, crashing. And it sounded, you know, when she thought back about it after these many years, it sounded like big, single you know, bipedal footsteps right now yeah so anyway what was so curious about this is she hadn't thought anything of this until um jeremy was asking people he knew if they'd had bigfoot encounters and you know he talked to her about that so she shared with uh, him that as the years went on and she learned more about bigfoot you know through television and whatever else was happening the many programs that she thought it was so peculiar that these things might have been related to a Bigfoot in the area. It's just that, again, at the time, her only frame of reference was bear. So that, you know, that was what was happening was there's a big bear out there. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when he starts, when Jeremy starts doing a little further investigation, if you take a look and you go ahead, you can Google Snohomish County in Washington and you'll find out that's one of the <laughs> that's one of the top spots if you want to see a Bigfoot. Oh yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of sightings right in that area. And he's and you start going through some of the sightings that you can find that are just online. I mean, this isn't even this is a oh, very yeah. simple simple search. And what you find is you you'll find incidents where they had the same putrid smell just south of Mountain Loop Highway where they were located. Right. So in the very same place, the very kinds of uh, stinky smells in the footfalls. I hadn't, we didn't find anything yet about, about the salmon. You start but finding you start correlation, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what we, that's essentially what, what he's doing. Jeremy's doing now is he's expanding uh, that search and he'll be contacting uh, Thorfinn in Washington and passing that information along to see if that could be helpful in expanding in, in expanding any of his current research. Absolutely, yeah, that's the way to do it. The frig, man. Hey, Tom, can I, not to, not to shift gears on you necessarily, but um, I know you spent a lot of time interviewing Will earlier today. Yes. Or, I'm sorry, yesterday. Yesterday, yes. And then sending us the files. I went through some of that 
and, and kind of picked out a few things and some things that I had thought about before when we had started to talk about our formatting for reporting. Yes. Want to get into some of that potentially? Uh, of Abs absolutely. Results, or we can kind of maybe uh, frame out some of that and, and uh, you know, for the benefit, since we've got all, it, it sounds like I was having difficulty getting on, but since we pretty much got all of us in one place here for the first time. Yeah, it's a, it's a good time to talk about it. And that's kind of what I had in mind was, you know, we can sort of, I mean, we, we can talk about individual reports, things that go on, but, you know, sort of what goes into a report and, and not, like I said, not just the details, but um, there are a lot of things that surround a report, surround a 